Today we're going to visit Bonneguil Castle in the Lot et Garonne department. The castle dates from the 13th century but was extensively rebuilt by Jean de Roquefeuille and his son Berenger. Berenger had been sent by his father to the court of French King Louis XI. In the aftermath of the War of the Ligue du Bien Public, Berenger left Amboise and retired to the south. In the 1480s, Berenger continued the reconstruction of Bonneguil Castle, which he had inherited from his father. He described himself as being short and of a weak constitution. He was irascible, haughty and mistrusting. In his testament, he called himself Le Magnifique. Despite his claim of being of ill health, he lived a long life and died in 1530 in Bonneguil Castle at the age of 82. Berenger was buried in the nearby Saint-Michel Chapel. The castle was passed on to the sons in the family line until it ended. In 1761, the abandoned castle came into the hands of Marguerite de Fumel. She restored the castle but died just before the laws of the French Revolution ordered a partial demolition of the castle. To enter the castle, we have to climb up to the northern gate. Outside the castle, we encounter the first ditch. It runs under what was once the first drawbridge. There were seven drawbridges in the castle, but they were suppressed by Marguerite of Fumel. Above the gate, you can still see the slits for the chains of the drawbridge. Once through the gate, we find ourselves in the Barbican. From here, we have a good view of the castle itself, with the keep on the left. Above the gate was a guard's room, and right next to it, a tower with the porter's lodgings. In this tower, there was an embrasure through which the porter could keep an eye on the gate and shoot uninvited guests if necessary. The embrasures aiming at the outside ditch could be reached via trapdoors in the Barbican. Before the main bridge, there used to be a subterranean storage room. Here we also find the depotoir. To the left is the Colombier. The depotoir was once an arsenal, but was used in later times as a place to dump garbage. The door is new, before one needed to use a trapdoor to get here. Unfortunately, the door is closed and we cannot access this place. Colombier, also a defensive structure and later turned into a pigeon house. We could only access the bottom bits. The bottom part of the Colombier could only be reached via a trapdoor in the ceiling. The difference between a pigeonnier and the Colombier is that the Colombier is an adjoining structure in the castle. From here we reach a small drawbridge towards the courtyard. From up here we have a great view of the main bridge and the immense ditch. This drawbridge has been reconstructed. It rests on a small turret which could be reached via a trapdoor in the bridge. We now enter the lower courtyard which was once completely paved. To the right is the keep. It's built on the base of the old 13th century castle. The keep has an unusual boat-like shape. The square holes in the rock underneath the keep indicate that there must have been some kind of roof or overhang in this courtyard. There are two guard towers on each side here and in between were the lodgings of the men-at-arms and the servants. These buildings are now mostly ruined. In fact, they used to be completely covered with the rubble and shrubbery until they were cleared during restorations. The part on the right of the keep is the original dungeon. Take note of the pillar at the back. This was a fountain which got its water from the well in the main courtyard at the other side of the keep. We will get there a bit later in the video. The first floor of the tower near the drawbridge was not accessible, but we can enter the first floor of the south tower, where a latrine is present.
From here we can enter a little platform from where we can have a little view of the buildings behind the wall. There used to be stairs here to go down to the lower level. From the stairs that run down between the two buildings, we can enter the bakery. In the bakery, we see two ovens. The big one was for baking and the second one was to recuperate the ashes. The ashes were used for cleaning and other purposes. Behind the ovens is a small corridor leading to the base of the tower. Here we find another latrine. The pit that we see was accessible via a trapdoor. It was not a prison or oubliette, but probably a storage room. We go further down the stairs to the north to West Boulevard. Here we have access to the Northeast Defense Tower. We enter the lower level of the Northern Defense Tower. There were three cannon loopholes. The other holes you see were used for pieces of wooden scaffolding. We leave the tower via the bottom door. To our left is a semicircular guard tower which guarded the east. This guard tower has mostly been demolished. It still has a gutter for the rainwater. We're now going to enter the northern ditch. When we have passed the main bridge, we see a small semicircular tower next to the big one. It has five embrasures and guarded the ditch. It was only accessible via the cave underneath the keep, which we will enter later on. Then we see the great tower. It was 40 meters high. The bottom levels were used for defense and storage, the higher ones for living.
We're now going to return to the East Boulevard. We are going to enter the casemate, which gives access to the Southern Boulevard and the Grotto. The way the new castle was constructed was quite old-fashioned at the time, a time when the first Loire castles were being constructed. Bonneguil was built to withstand sieges and artillery fire. The castle was not an unimportant strategic location and would never be besieged, and Berger never took part in any war. In 1860, the castle came into the possession of the community of Fumel and has since then become a tourist attraction. The grotto was probably a large natural cave that was enlarged by hand. It splits up in two parts. One of the corridors ends in the northern ditch and the other one leads to a smaller cave where we see a pillory. and a small dragon. Here is also the entrance to the Moino. This bit was not accessible. We go back from where we came and go on towards the eastern and southern boulevard. From this little garden, we have a great view of the southern part of the castle. Even though it's ruined, it's still quite spectacular. The tower on the southern side is the Red Tower. This is ruined and it was not accessible. It's a bit of a shame because there's a latrine built into the wall of the first floor. We can still see the drains for the latrine though. There is also the remainder of a defense tower. Next to it is the door of the chicane. We are going to use this chicane to enter the terrace. The terrace was created on the old wall by Marguerite Fumel and it contained formal gardens. Here you have a great overview of the west side of the castle. On the left is the big tower, in the middle the square tower and on the right the red tower. In the nook between the great tower and the lodgings there is a drain. This is the drain for the latrines in the great tower. Now let's go back up to the entrance of the square tower via the chicane. The chicane is a narrow zigzag corridor for pedestrians. This way they could enter the castle in case of an attack.
We end up near the square tower. This was once accessible via a drawbridge, but it's now replaced by stairs. Inside we go up to the lodgings of the Lord and the Great Hall. There used to be a mobile drawbridge connecting the stairs in the lodgings and square tower. The rooms on the right side, now mostly ruined, and the Red Tower were the private chambers of the Lord and his family. On the other side is a large room, only illuminated by two loopholes, and there we can see a model of the castle. In the back, a door gives access to the Great Tower, but this was closed. The first floor of the square tower was used as an oratory or a private chapel. On the first floor of the lodgings between the towers is the Great Hall, with the grand fireplace. This is the place where Berenger wrote his will. At the back of this room is access to one of the round rooms of the Great Tower, the only one we could enter. Now there are some graffiti here near the window, but I didn't film them because some people were blocking access and later I forgot. I was more interested in the latrine. There's a circular stairwell built into the wall of the Great Tower, but it only goes up to the first floor. Mm -hmm. 
Now we go back to the large room and go up to the ruined upper floor. From here we have a great view of the magical Asians of the Great Tower. Their pyramid shape is rather unusual. Huh? On this floor there's also a door that leads to the Great Tower, but the room is used for educational purposes and was closed. Luckily, there was also a latrine, and that was not closed. We go down the stairs again, and this time through a pretty medieval door, and enter the main courtyard. At the back of this courtyard is the well, and next to it the ruined kitchens. It was from this well that water was sent down via gutters to the fountain in the courtyard below. Via a set of stairs behind the well, one could reach the lower courtyard, but these are now ruined. On the left side of the dungeon is a window high up. This used to be the original door. Now there's a door to the right. There was once a drawbridge protecting the door on the right, but this is now gone and replaced by stairs. As mentioned before, the dungeon has an unusual shape, that of a boat. The first floor of the dungeon has a fireplace and a 15th century window. The dungeon is quite small and was not really suitable for living, so that's why new living quarters were built at the other side of the courtyard. The vaulted ceiling also dates from the 15th century. The keystone is a Greek monogram for Jesus. On the terrace, we have a great view of the ruined castle and the surrounding area.
A small tower on this dungeon is a get, an observation tower on the highest point of a castle. Now we go down again and leave the courtyard via the main gate. There were two drawbridges, a large one for horses and carriages and a small one for pedestrians. Above the gate one can see the coat of arms of the Roquefort family. Horse stables were probably located outside the castle as they were in the 18th century. So we leave with one more look at this absolutely amazing castle. <laughs>